Boy. Thank you, voice. Uh, hello to everybody, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to History Matters and Ouch, my mug is hot, so does coffee. Um, today, as promised, we're going to be talking about, I got a closed chat because you guys will distract me endlessly. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, today, we're going to be talking, as promised, about the Constitution because it is Constitution Day. So um, that's in one way or another what we're going to explore and then discuss as a group. But before we do that, I am going to turn things over to my partner in crime, Matt, who will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see everybody. Um, again, uh, Annie, our thoughts and prayers go out to, all, to you and your family. That's, um, and if we can be helpful in any way, we are a community in both good and bad times. So um, <clears throat> our rules of the game are as follows. We encourage you to use chat. Please make sure to uh, put in whatever your thoughts are on what's being said. And um, try to add to the conversation, add links, whatever you'd like to do. We have a great community here. And so we'd like to see everybody contributing to it. Uh, we just ask, of course, that you keep it family friendly and germane to the conversation as much as possible. And uh, if you do have questions for Joanne, please make sure you put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I do take the questions from Q&A. It's a lot easier to keep track of everything. That way I don't miss anything scrolling through chat as we are going along. And if you like what we're doing here at the National Council of History Education, we encourage you to join us. Uh, go ahead, head over to our website, uh, www.nche. Uh, it does look like blue highlights, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, www.nchetteach.org and uh, look around. We uh, yesterday put up um, our webinars for the fall. So we're really excited about those, including uh, folks like Dr. Eric Jackson. Uh, we'll be doing something with the Educating for American Democracy with a number of other partners. And um, in October, we'll be welcoming Kevin Cruz. So we're, we're excited to have some great folks this fall. Um, and then in the next week or so, we'll be announcing our uh, Spring 22 Colloquia um, along with our NEH grant, which we uh, are really looking forward to uh, inviting folks to join. So lots going on here at NCHG. Please join us, check it out. And I am particularly loquacious today, so I'm going to turn it over to Joanne so we can get to some real meat of the Constitution today. Okay. And Newbie already has a lot to say because he is, after all, a history bird. So, okay. Um, so what I want to talk about today, I, I, Matt is actually the person who said, and he actually said this two weeks ago. So Matt, you're getting due credit. Maybe we should do something on the constitution for constitution day. Wise man. And I thought that that was indeed a fine thing to do. But of course the question is always what would be useful to do when speaking about the constitution. Newbie, I know you have a lot to say. <laughs> At any rate, um, what I thought I would do, since basically thinking about the Constitution and about its limits and what it can do and what it can't do, seems to be filling a lot of our mental space these days. Um, what I would do talk would be to talk a little bit about how it was conceived in the founding era uh, and to talk about some of the things that we've learned about the Constitution or certainly that I have um, experienced in a gut-wrenching kind of a way about the Constitution uh, in the last few years uh, to open a conversation about the Constitution and what it is and what it's supposed to be, and as I said on Twitter, what it can do and what it can't do. Um, and I want to say at the outset, um, one of the books that I found particularly useful in preparing my comments this morning um, is a pretty recent book by Jonathan Ginap called The Second Creation, Fixing the American Constitution in the Founding Era. And fixing um, has a complicated meaning. So it doesn't just mean, darn, it's wrong, we need to fix it. But the book is really about um, how did that generation conceive of the Constitution, meaning um, how do they imagine it? What kind of document do they imagine it to be? And one of the things that um, he points out in his introduction is that it is called at various times in that time period, machine, instrument, frame, fabric, system, engine, order of things, compact, charter of incorporation, 
fundamental law, structure, and text. That's a pretty wide variation in what the Constitution is. And I think, you know, I, I have said this probably a few million times so far on History Matters that particularly when you're looking at the founding period, um, of course, is a, is a dangerous phrase that there are not of courses in the way that you think there are about the founding period. You can't say or shouldn't say, of course, there was a revolution. Of course, the United States won the revolution. Of course, there was a constitution. Of course, it was ratified. There, of course, is really do a, an injustice to the founding era and the fact that they were really trying to figure things out as they went for better and worse. So the constitution falls into the of course, category meaning, well, of course, we had a constitution and of course it worked and blah, blah, blah. But just because there was a constitution created doesn't mean that everyone stepped back and assumed it would be a self sufficient thing and they could sign off and walk into a government, right? That in particularly in those early years, they were really, as all of those words that I just uh, suggested, read out there, suggest, they were really trying to figure out precisely what it meant. Now, one of the things that I've always thought was um, interesting about this period generally and about thinking about constitutions is the fact that um, that generation of people are certainly either they or the immediately previous generation, they were particularly um, charter or constitution minded. Meaning if you came over to North America as a colonist, you came over under a charter, which told you your rights and sort of set up whatever polity was in place within that colony. So uh, Americans, North Americans, Americans, British Americans um, were, were charter minded or, or constitution minded in a way that they might not have been back in England. So they knew, you know, what their charter said about their government. Colonies generally were clustered along the seaboard as far as population goes. So they also generally knew who represented them. They knew people in government or they knew who they should know in government or they knew someone who knew someone. So in other words, government was um, closer, I suppose, and more personal in some ways than we might experience it today. So you put those two things together, people had expectations of what the government should be and should do and, and how they or that someone who they could convince to act on their behalf could act for them and that um, a constitution or a charter, something on paper was important. Um, you put that together and you can see how that all by itself would begin to frame what people in the founding era would assume about the constitution. Now, um, I have a couple quotes here that I found that said that, will say this much better than I just did. Um, and one of them is an early Supreme Court Justice, William Patterson. Um, and he says, his couple sentences here of his, it is difficult to say what the constitution of England is because not being reduced to written certainty and precision, it lies entirely at the mercy of the parliament. In England, there is no written constitution, no fundamental law, nothing visible, nothing real, nothing certain. In America, the case is widely different. Every state in the union has its constitution reduced to written exactitude and precision. Now there are several things in that statement one might argue with. Um, the one that I wanna focus on uh, is written exactitude and precision. Um, and I'm not yet, I will touch on originalism at the end of my comments here, but the fact that the constitution has, it, it's just facts, just the facts, ma'am, is that dragnet? Um, that it's just facts and words that all have absolutely clear meanings and that it is exact and precise, given all the arguments that we're having today and that the United States has experienced over several centuries, we all know that that's a bit of an overstatement. However, it is true that there was significant scene to setting this down on paper to create a new national government. Um, and there was a sense at the time in the founding era, although they, they did call it all of these various nouns and they were still sort of, as, as Guinaf writes in his book, kind of imagining what the constitution meant or should be, there was a sense that whatever it was, it was supposed to be um, a document with difference. So in other words, um, it was supposed to have some weight to it and, and some gravitas to it. It wasn't supposed to be like another piece of legislation that could be tossed around. It was meant to have an impact and a lasting impact of some kind, although what that meant, what that would be, and what kind of an impact that would be very much up for grabs. But so the, the constitution was supposed to be something with added weight 
uh, depending how much weight depends on who you asked. But still, it was supposed to be a document apart in some way. That said, this gets us back to the lack of exactitude and precision. From the moment it went into effect, there was disagreement about what it meant, about what it allowed, about what it didn't allow. The most obvious example of that is, of, of course, Hamilton and Jefferson, because they were there in Washington's first administration arguing about what kind of powers the Constitution did or didn't give the government. And to, to simplify that to shockingly brief and simple terms, um, Hamilton essentially saw the Constitution as something that enabled power. So it was something that told you what the government was able to do. And Jefferson saw it as something that restrained power, things that the government wasn't supposed to go beyond. And that's their, their early discussion, and particularly when it gets written down on paper, when Hamilton proposes creating a national bank, that's some of what they're talking about, which is really fundamentally, what does a constitution do? Um, Hamilton, in that case, he wins that argument. Jefferson says, the constitution says that um, the government should do what is necessary and proper. He, he focuses on the necessary and proper clause, says that that's all that should happen. And Hamilton says, what do those words precisely mean? Necessary and proper. Um, I mean, you could eliminate everything that needs to get done by saying, well, is it absolutely necessary? So he basically says that, that I can't remember the phrase he uses. I did not look that up before this morning, but he says something essentially like that would, that would create an utter roadblock. The, the, the government would be able to undo, to, to not do anything. It would be stuck trying to prove that things are necessary or not. So this is where you get and still taught, I'm sure, in, in high schools today, broad construction, which is Hamilton of the Constitution, or loose construction, I'm sorry, broad and loose construction, or strict construction. You know what, guys, here's the dread secret of this morning. I was running so late that I made my coffee and have not had a sip of it yet. <laughs> I'm pre-coffee. You're getting me pre-coffee. At any rate, you get Hamilton with the loose construction and Jefferson with the strict construction of what the Constitution means. And you know Hamilton is in on the writing of it. So to pretend that there's one precise meaning of the Constitution ever is a problematic thing to say. Um, and that said, you know, even more extreme. And many of you, I've probably talked about this at some point before. But Jefferson, in a very famous letter that he writes to Madison, believes that every generation, he states at least, that every generation should be able to create its own Constitution. Right? That the dead hand of the past should not have weight on the activities and the actions and the liberties of the president. Um, Madison, who he writes the letter to, is not precisely thrilled with that idea, but it, it's getting at a, a sort of Jeffersonian conception of what the constitution is, right? Which is, it's important, it's a shared pact of some kind, but every generation should have a right to create their own. Uh, that just, it, it um, I, I can't even describe the, the fear with which that <laughs> leads me to just, it fills me with the fear of, can you imagine every generation, oh, time to make a new constitution. Sorry, Mr. Jefferson, I can't go along with that. But the idea behind it, you can see what he's saying, is that um, the constitution represents an attribution or an allotment of power. And what that means and how that works are always up for debate and who decides at any given moment how that debate lands. So there's, there's, sort of a variety of feelings about what the Constitution is and what it does. Jefferson also, along with his sort of um, loose and easy sense of the Constitution, and I know I've mentioned this before when I talked about um, the election of 1800, after the election has been decided and he is president and someone says to him, you know, things were pretty ugly there for a time and we didn't even know were the Federalists going to somehow try to steal the election or stop the election. It was pretty scary. What would you have done if something like that had happened? And Jefferson, this is a bad paraphrase of his answer, but Jefferson essentially says, well, you know, we would have stopped and um, revised, tweaked the Constitution, sort of fixed it up, you know, wound up the watch again, I think is the metaphor he uses, and then gone back to work. So According to his lights, that's how he understood the Constitution. It's there. It's important. It sets limits and boundaries in an important kind of a way, but um, it's revisable. It, it, it is limited in important ways. Um, it shifts and changes depending on the circumstances. So when I think about the Constitution and when I write about 
the Constitution. I guess I, I blend these things together. On the one hand, um, I think about the fact that regardless of how we interpret it or, or the fact that we disagree so fervently in how we interpret it, um, we do generally agree as American citizens that the Constitution is a kind of shared pact between us, or at least we should agree as Americans that the Constitution is kind of a shared pact. We basically sign on to the idea of the Constitution, what it represents, the general structure of government that it creates. Um, we can argue about how we interpret that, but it does represent a kind of shared pact. If you're going to be in the United States, this is where the United States government starts. So, but I think the idea of it as a pact, and I actually don't think that was in that list of words I just read. That's kind of how I think about it. Um, as a pact uh, that people sort of agree on if you're in this country to sort of be loyal to in some way, um, that's a pretty basic fundamental idea, but I think it's an important one because in a lot of ways, um, and this sort of shifts us into the direction of what the government, what the constitution can't do. Um, in a lot of ways, the constitution is absolutely bare bones skeletal as, a, as something that's setting out a structure of government. I mean, it's very brief considering what it does. Um, it, it sort of creates structures of government. It sets out checks and balances so that each can check the other. And I, again, trying to allocate and, and um, bound in and also channel how power is being used and directed. But uh, as we've experienced all too well in recent years, there's so much that isn't in that document. And, and which was deliberate. There, they, there was no assumption at the time that the constitution could, could touch on or should touch on every possible circumstance in this new and at the time what was considered to be experimental government. They, there was no assumption they could do that. They assumed that and machine, once the machine was put in motion, which is a phrase that they use a lot in this time period, once the machine was put in motion, people would be able to figure out and, and flesh out aspects of the government uh, that were not addressed to the constitution. But the fact remains for what it does and the power that it has, the constitution is, is remarkably yeah. skeletal. Even New York traffic agrees with me on this and newbies, There's a lot going on here. Um, but what that means and what we've been discovering, and even you know, as someone who's been writing and thinking about the founding for a very long time, uh, has discovered in the last, I don't know, five years or so, uh, is the degree to which our constitutional system of government relies on norms. Norms are not in writing. Norms are not in the constitution. But, and I know, I think we've had a whole episode maybe on norms, we've done so many at this point, uh, and I didn't do, I, I forgot my Carolee moment, I'll have to do it at the end of how many episodes this is. I wanna say this is like episode number 74 or something like that, 76, 76? Yes, I need new glasses too. 76, thank you Carolee. <laughs> She's so quick, it's episode 76. I know I've done something on norms at some point, but here in this discussion, that's significant because the degree to which things aren't in the constitution and that they are guided by norms and norms meaning things that generally happen but that we don't necessarily question until someone violates them and then suddenly we realize, oh, we can't stop that. It's not something the constitution really addresses. Uh, is it really violating a law? And if it is, are we going to enforce that? Uh, how are we going to enforce that differently for different levels of government? If a president does something wrong, what do we do with that? Um, norm and the idea that some, some, there's a way in which things are normally done uh, that we accept and don't think very hard about until they're violated. And then we realize we might not be able to confront it. That really exposes some of the ways in which the constitution can't do things. So at, although it is a pact in a general way, that represents sort of signing on to the American nation, it's a pretty bare bones pact. It leaves a lot of holes and it requires in the same way that you sort of, even if you don't do it in a conscious way, sign on to that constitutional mode of governance. You know, you sign on to the general ideas of government that it encapsulates and represents. If you don't, what happens? 
big question, what happens? What happens if you basically don't really care whether you're doing something unconstitutional um, or whether you um, don't particularly care uh, one way or another if you know you're doing something unconstitutional, but you assume you won't be held responsible for it, so it doesn't really matter. Um, you don't care about the, the guides or boundaries that the Constitution sets. Um, you're not particularly devoted to democracy. Uh, you're willing to attack things that seem like they should be pretty basic, almost structures of government. What happens when that happens? What happens when you step forward and do something blatantly, aggressively, um, seemingly uh, violating the pact that we've signed onto? That's a big question, and it doesn't have an absolute answer yet. Um, and I think uh, I've been writing about this recently, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and it, in a sense, it's something that really underrides, um, is, the, is the grounding of American government. And although it's, there's, there are aspects of the Constitution that strengthen it, it's not officially there. And that is accountability. And that's essentially what I'm writing about now, is the importance of accountability in American governance and in democratic governance. If a government is supposedly grounded on the people, on the people voting, on the popular will, on the general good, the people are the ones who have or should have the power and the people who they give power to should be accountable in the way that they use it to the people. They are indeed public servants in this sense. Accountability is, is at the heart of democracy. It means the people with power are accountable for what they do. And if they do something that shouldn't be done, they should be held accountable. How they're held accountable is a different question. We can have a different conversation. But the fact of the matter is, if there are people who blatantly, aggressively, and even happily violate pretty fundamental aspects of our constitutional pact and our political pact and our civil pact with each other, and there's no accountability of any kind. And by that, of course, I mean, I've been writing about January 6th. So I'm talking about attacking the US government. Um, if people can be involved in that and are not held accountable, people who might be in positions of power, there might be government office holders who facilitated that, we don't know. If that happens, it's really important for Americans to know that anyone who does that will be held accountable. Because number one, if no one is held accountable, then really what power does the constitution have and why wouldn't anyone do it again? There's no punishment. There's no reason not to repeat the crime, right? We haven't held anyone accountable. We've basically said, yeah, well, it's kind of wrong, but you know, we're sort of gonna normalize it by not responding to it. It, it, it accountability, and this is, I've been struggling with this. So I'm now struggling with speaking about it. I'm struggling with writing about it because it's, um, it's kind of nebulous, it's kind of intangible. And it sounds almost like a weak statement to say accountability is at the heart of democratic governments. Like people need to be held accountable for things seems like a truism and, and sort of a nothing statement at the same time. But I think given the ways in which the constitution is so skeletal, I think trust and faith and belief and accountability, I think there are all of these intangibles that uphold our political system that uphold constitutional government. And there are things that we don't necessarily think about until they're threatened or attacked or violated. And we run the possibility of that being too late for us to address them. So on this constitution day, in a sense, that, that's where I end up landing, which is, um, although I start out by talking about the significance of the constitution um, and how it is a shared pact between all of us, it, the absolute meaning of it has never been absolutely precisely clear. Yet, thinking about all of the things around it, are, it's vitally important and uh, gets us back to norms. But to really honor the Constitution on Constitution Day, I think you need to really think seriously about what it does and what it can't do or doesn't do or shouldn't do 
But that isn't to say that we shouldn't be thinking about those things as well. So the constitution is all of these things, right? Machine, instrument, frame, fabric, system, engine, order of things, compact, charter of incorporation, fundamental law, structure, text. It's all of those things. It's also a, a kind of base <laughs> of what the government is. And it requires more of us to keep the government going, to keep the government going in the spirit that a democracy would suggest it keeps going in. We are, um, the constitution is a starting point, but we as the American people have a responsibility now to support it in ways that perhaps we haven't thought about supporting it before. Um, this is an interesting moment. And um, as a historian, it's um, an understatement, isn't it? Um, as a historian, I don't like to say, it's never happened before. Um, I won't say that, but I will say that this particular um, conglomeration, this grouping of crises that we're experiencing at the moment, this particular cluster of crises and questions and threats, this is a distinctive moment. Uh, it's not that democracy has never been threatened before, but it has never been threatened in this way, this profoundly in this broad way before. Um, and so, I do think this gets us back to the importance of the Constitution on Constitution Day and the importance of addressing what it can't do and the ways in which we need to be aware of the fact that the spirit of government matters as much as the words of government as well. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop there. I actually not, because I'm out of time for my half hour. I, I had some stuff that I jotted down here on originalism um, which I'm happy to address if you would like me to. Um, I have uh, Amy Coney Barrett, as she described originalism. Um, I'll say in just a, a phrase, what's interesting is when you go online and, and look to see sort of the consensus of views about originalism, what you discover is there's not really a consensus of views about originalism. So if you can say that the constitution itself has many meanings and it always has, and originalists say, no, there's one meaning, what it meant at the time, there's not even one understanding of what it means to be an originalist. So um, at any rate, we can talk about that or whatever else you'd like to address. The important point I wanted to make um, for today was just how vitally important the document is and how vitally important it is to realize what it doesn't contain, what it doesn't do, and what we are responsible for. Okay. Um, mug, 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 Carolee has done her duty. See, even though I turned off chat, it appears on the bottom there. Okay, and Carolee, this is important. I still haven't had a sip of coffee yet, so I expect general um, approval from you that I managed to just do a half hour of relatively coherent speech with no coffee, and I stayed up really late. Okay, so the mug for today, It's a Carolee mug. It, it's, I have to get the wording right. Thank well you done. for being in democracy every Friday morning. We just did that in a hyper way by discussing the constitution. Kind of can't get more constitutional than that in a sense. So, and it's a good day to honor Carolee, which is also part of why I chose the mug, but that is the choice of mug. It is a great mug. It has lots of the silly things I say on the back and I'm not gonna show you that side, <laughs> but this side is really good. The other side just makes me laugh at myself. Okay, and and Matt, you, your head did not block the words now so that everyone could guess. Yes, yes, and if you didn't hear me earlier, I, I, you, I, I know I used Independence Hall last year. It was one of our early episodes, so I couldn't use it again. So I had to go with the National Constitution Center. Um, I'm sure they will appreciate that, the National yes. Constitution Center. If yes. they only knew. I'm oh, saving the archives for some other talk. So um. <laughs> I'm going to open up, oops, open up chat again. There we go. So I, people are I will say that our audience is both, well, either really engaged in what you're talking about or really doesn't want to hear me ask, ask questions today because there are like 10 questions already. Wow. And I'm excited okay. to get going here. So. Um, but as always, add in more questions uh, as we go along. Please feel free, because I will try to answer or ask as many questions as possible. Uh, Dave wants to know, what arguments did the founders have about how many people should House members represent? How many should House members represent today? 
Well, um, part of the problem, and this is going to be an obvious thing, but I'll say it anyway. Um, part of the problem of representation had to do with what do you do with enslaved people, right? That gets right. that gets us to the three fifths compromise. Compromise, um, which is uh, how can you in the southern states that in which people were enslaving people in vast quantities, can you enslave people and treat them as property and then claim them as people to up your representation? And actually, this is something, it kind of stuns me. Um, it's the dreaded three-fifths compromise abyss on Twitter. If you go on Twitter and say anything about the three-fifths compromise, there's always someone who steps forward and says it was a win for the, for the it was a loss. It was a win for the North and a loss for the South. And, you know, no matter how many times you say, well, it gave the South more representation than they should have. It gave them representation based on people they're enslaving and not treating as people. People always say, yeah, but they wanted everyone. So the fact that they only got half of, you know, part of what they wanted means it was a loss for the South. And no matter how many times I say, yeah, but the South had extra bonus power. Like the South dominated the government. The South got stuff out of it. It's not a Southern loss. No one wants to hear that. It's, it's the abyss. So whenever I'm on social media and I'm, someone walks into the three-fifths zone, I think, ooh, <laughs> I've been at the bottom of that abyss, having people jump on my head, refusing to acknowledge that the South benefited from that and that it, it did a disservice to Black Americans and that it benefited the slaveholders. No one wants that to be true, but that is. But that's, that's one way in which obviously the question of representation um, was bound up with everything else. Obviously, it's another way as well in which the census is important. We haven't really talked about the census. It was uh, under debate a lot uh, a little while back about what questions should be included or who should be included or what it should be counting. Um, and that's one of the many things that gives the census such great importance is as a counting mechanism, because that fundamentally shapes our government. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know, so it's not just a matter of how interesting there's whatever percentage of people more of this that it's it's fundamentally about representation and um, sort of how the government its powers um, and its its gifts of sorts get distributed, um, because it's it accounts for where America is, in a sense, so um, I don't have an absolute I don't know if you're looking for a more um, concrete, like on January 4th, they said, actually, the, the convention wasn't in January. But at any rate, if you're looking for some kind of statement, um, I don't have that uh, poof instant. Um, but representation was one of the key issues um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and also partly because, you know, again, this kind of just gets us back to the Constitutional Convention, but the power of big states versus the power of small states uh, was a huge question, right? Should, should the small states wanted every state to have basically equal power so they wouldn't be outnumbered? The large states obviously wanted to have power that represented the fact that they were larger and had more, more people potentially in them. So these kinds of debates were essential at the time. So representation kind of made its way throughout many issues. It's when, when I teach, um, the constitution at the beginning of my, at the end of my revolution class and the beginning of my early national class, I usually sort of boil, um, I, I, I apologize in advance and I, and I say there were, you know, a handful of major controversies that we'll address here and there were more, but these are the ones we're going to address. Uh, and one of them is representation and one of them is um, executive power. Um, and one of them is something that isn't a major issue but that should have been one and that's slavery. It's a long semi-answer to your no, question. It's, no, it's a good one. Cause I think uh, one of the things that, and this is what I think Dave was kind of getting at is that idea of representation today um, seems to be deeply affecting um, our electoral process. And so uh, so understanding how our founder, founders thought about it is really helpful in thinking about how we might, as Jefferson say, you know, <laughs> tweak it or what, whatever the phrasing he, you know, like just, fix it a little bit and then move on to business or whatever. So, um, Bess, just say, yes, you, this is a sloth mug. It's adorable. It's my daughter's. Um, it's also the most uncomfortable thing to drink out of because the head hits you like square in the eye every time you try to try, try to take a sip. So, somehow which I forgot about when I grabbed it this morning. It's, it's somehow weirdly appropriate because sloths <laughs> are so unassuming. It really is. 
<laughs> more unassuming than they should be probably so. right <laughs> uh tim asked a great question which I, I honestly i've thought of this myself over the years uh why is the second amendment so confusing why do you think they wrote a well-regulated militia at first and then change it to the right of people to keep and bear arms oh boy um okay so i'll answer this one in brief because you could talk about this for a very long time yeah um, but to tie it to what I was talking about today. Um, one of the things, um, as a matter of fact, let me find it here. Um, one of the things that I found online when I was poking around um, on originalism was debate about the meanings of words and if they change or mean the same thing and then the importance of the social context around which words are used. So for example, equality or equal in, in the founding period means something very different than what equal means today. Um, so part of what we're looking at with the Second Amendment is words that might have had a different meaning then. No one's really thinking about that meaning. Well-regulated militia. People aren't really thinking about what the, what the militia is. They don't really think about what well-regulated means. They're just taking it as, um, you know, a right. And the question is, um, and, and this is part of the answer to this question, why is it so complicated or why is it so confusing? This is part of it, right? It's a, it's a right, Americans, um, to say that Americans are gun crazy is the greatest understatement one can make. But given that, um, the Second Amendment becomes obviously profoundly, enormously important to the point that it's another social media thing. Um, there are people uh, on social media, and granted there are people on social media who will say just about anything, but this has happened to me multiple times. They're talking about the Constitution, the Constitution, and it, you ask a few questions and it becomes apparent they're thinking about the Bill of Rights. So that when I say, no, the Constitution actually created the government, the Bill of Rights is part of the Constitution, some people actually don't even want to go down that road. They're like, oh, yeah, there's the government stuff. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so, so in this sort of rights-centric moment that we're in, uh, it, it would be interesting for someone um, and actually Pauline Mayer was writing about the Bill of Rights uh, when she died. It would be interesting for someone to write something now on how people perceive of the Bill of Rights and how that's changed in the last two decades versus a while back. Because I suspect given how everyone is focused on rights, it has probably a different kind of a context to it now and how people are using it. And the second amendment kind of falls right into that. So the wording of it become important to people who want to be able to have guns and to people who want to cut back on the fact that everybody can have guns. Um, and like everything else, this is again, this is kind of a great example of the problem of originalism uh, is okay, so there you have it, the original text, go. You, it, it's, it's obvious to say that you can't directly apply something written in 1787 or 1788 to current questions today. Um, but this is a great example of that. And it's so complicated and fraught because it, it touches on a right um, that people have an emotional response to. People who want to have guns have a strongly emotional response to. And because of that, people who don't want there to be so many guns have a powerful response to because it, it, there's no um, debate of any kind going on there. There's no, there's no um, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, no one is willing to budge, really, or certainly the gun people are not very willing to budge <laughs> on what they insist are their rights. Um, and that, as in so many things in um, American politics nowadays, that becomes a non-conversation. Mm -hmm. And there's not much you can do in a non-conversation. So if one side says, okay, well, what if we just do this one thing? What if we just make an extra day for people to get a license? No, you know, that you can't go very far. Um, so it's all of these reasons, I think, are, are why the Second Amendment is particularly fraught. And there's been so much good scholarship done on that. Um, Saul Cornell, a uh, uh, historian of early America and a, a friend of mine, has done a lot of great work on the Second Amendment. So I would, I would recommend his work too. Uh, Dale, <clears throat> uh, uh, I love the way, I'm gonna read this verbatim instead of paraphrasing okay. because I love the way he put this. Um, with all due respect to Mr. Madison, <laughs> would you talk would you talk a bit about Governor Morris, Master Wordsmith, and my favorite founder, the man who wrote We the People and the rest of the preamble? 
What was his view on the Constitution's implementation? Wow. So yeah, so um, Governor Morris. Um, oh, Governor Morris, sorry. My I fault. believe that's how you pronounce him. I've called him that forever. And in my classes, um, I call him the Goov because the goof. Um, he has a sense of humor and he's kind of a quirky quirky dude, the Goov. So he somehow that, that fits him. Um, he uh, is not the most democratic of the founders. <laughs> that was delicately put. I mean, he's a federalist um, and actually, uh, there's a famous phrase that um, the, the, the people, the people are a great beast that often is attributed to Hamilton. Um, mm -hmm. Probably it came from something that Gouverneur Morris said. There's no evidence Hamilton said it. It's hearsay based on hearsay. But Morris said something about the people being a, a great monster or something like that. At any rate, he's not the most democratic founder. He very firmly believes that there are certain people who should have power and certain people who shouldn't and that the people as a mass um, are uncontrollable and dangerous, and he's in France during the French Revolution, and is really unhappy about what he sees. I should add, on my way to answering this question, um, one of his, it must be a son or a grandson, published, um, and I don't think there's a modern edition, a version of his diary from when he was in France. Really interesting, some strong views uh, to read. Uh, I, I can't remember the name, I'll remember it when I no longer need it, of the of the Morris who edited it, but at any rate. Um, so, you know, I th on the one hand, he was, you know, helping to style the writing of the constitution. I don't think that means that when we the people is starts the constitution that he or the others who approved of that phrase were necessarily thinking, yeah, you know, the people, I think what they were thinking was um, this document in a way that a monarchy does not represents the will of the people. So it is we, the people who ultimately are allowing this document to be put in effect. And we, the people, by putting people in office and removing them from office, control this government. But, but kind of back to what I said before about thinking what equal means. Um, I think we, the people, could mean a very different thing at that time to what it means today. So you know, particularly if he's like one of the people helping style the constitution, the phrase we, the people, um, certainly in his case does not mean like, this is us. Um, he, he very much believed that the better sort should be ruling, but Americans at the time um, truly did believe that one of, the th one of the things that set the American government under the constitution apart from a monarchy was the fact that public opinion ruled, that the public ruled in a more direct way, that people could be removed from power by the people. So in that sense, it really was a document that touched on all of the people and not just the states. Um, oh, you guys are like, damn, Gouverneur Morris, um, National Constitution Center blog has a post on Gouverneur Morris. Um, so yeah. Um, so Emily asks, I don't know if you can answer this or not. Uh, I know you're not a um, New Deal historian, but uh, Emily says, I was told yesterday that the passage of the New Deal violated the 10th Amendment. How is that possible? Oh, wow. No, th th you've gone beyond. <laughs> uh, so I, I thought so, but I want to toss it yeah. out there. Um, yeah, I'm not going to even be able to address that intelligently. I'm going to say something and it's going to be goofy and it will be recorded. So I'm not gonna <laughs> Well done. Uh, Gloria says, uh, how do you distinguish between the will of the people and the will of a specialized elect, elect, I think that's a specialized elect that uses the people as a justification for their acts. So how do you distinguish well, between the will of the people and saying that you're using the, the and this is actually prescient for me because there's something happening locally here right now that really strikes to this. So oh, you got to mention what that is before I answer though. All right. So in um, one of our counties up here in Northern Lower Michigan, um, in the last election, the will of the people passed a millage to fund early childhood education. Um, and the millage is written in such a way that it says up to 0.35 or whatever mills. And the county commissioners who have the ability to decide whether or not to actually do that um, you know, or they, they're the ones in charge of, you know, accounting, the accounting of the millage, 
um, said, okay, well, it says up to 0.35 or whatever. So we're going to set it at 0 0.000 because we don't think that the people really wanted early childhood education. Oh. And so we are, we are going to fund it at zero mills, um, even though the, it was passed by a popular election in the county. So it's actually kind of gets it, you know, so on one hand, you have the will of the people, which is the vote. And then on the other hand, you have people saying, well, we're, the, go, we're following the, we're following the will of the people because my constituents don't want to actually do, you know, fund early childhood education. So it's, I'm getting, so I, this is a really prescient question for me and, and thank you, Gloria, for raising it, which is how do you distinguish between the will of the people and the will of people who use the people as a justification for what they do? <laughs> and part of the answer to that um, is it's really hard. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's part of the reason why um, political parties were so suspect in this early period. Um, you know, I, I always joke that um, people at the time thought that political parties represented a small group of people looking to better themselves and not th thinking about the general good, which one might say is actually a pretty good definition of a political party. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, parties were suspect because they were not, by definition, they were not thinking about the general good. Um, lobbying and lobbyists, that whole idea in this period is also being sort of played with and experimented with, and people are unsure about what does that mean? It should be allowable, of course, but what does it mean? And of course, that again has to do with who is represented by who and who has power and who has a connection with people with power. Um, so I think the short answer to that question, how can you tell the difference between the people and a group that claims to represent them is, it's, it's, it's hard and ideally, <laughs> Ideally, the answer should be an election, right? Ideally, you have an election and the people vote and everyone who is eligible to vote gets to vote and the votes are counted. And then someone gets power who represents the popular will, at least of a majority of the populace. That's pretty fundamental stuff. Um, and there are any number of ways, obviously, in which we're in trouble on that count, but, um, you know, that, that's like um, at one point, um, Hamilton, uh, when he's se Secretary of the Treasury, he wants to know um, who in Congress are really uh, his supporters or his friends. And he can't do that standing back and, and putting people into columns because you can never tell what they really think. And so he says to someone in this letter, I don't remember um, what year it is now that he says it, it's late. So it's either the mid 1790s or it's got to be it's got to be the before 1795. But at any rate, he writes a letter and he says, let's just force a vote on something in Congress, because you'll see how people vote. And that'll we can draw a line like you vote this way on this. And they're my people. You vote this way. You're not my people. So in a variety of different ways, voting helped to answer that question. But um, it, it, it's beyond obvious to talk about the many ways in which a free and fair elections are pretty much the heart of our political mm -hmm. system. Uh, and without them, there is no democracy. You don't have to like the outcome, but. No, well, right. That's, that's. But the that thing. doesn't mean that you can't. You can't I've said that over and over again, and it's kind of shocking, right? Over yeah. and over again, in a variety of public venues, I'll be like, you know, in a democracy, sometimes you lose. Right. <laughs> you know, like sometimes <laughs> you don't win. And yes. if you think that you should always win, and that the people against you are always wrong, that's not a democracy, right? Yes. That's, that's not the will of the, the majority, that's the will of you, and that's a problem. <laughs> but I know all of this is obvious, and so I always feel um, slightly insane when I have to say these things, right? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to like, yeah. Yeah. Like Captain Obvious called and, you know, once, um, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, because sometimes <laughs> in a democracy, you lose elections. <laughs> right? Have to say that but the fact that we do have to say that shows precisely where we are exactly exactly well we have another question from the other tim so both ah. tims uh weighing in today um the national archives describes the declaration constitution and bill of rights as the charters of freedom do you have any idea where this term originated to describe these documents and does the title encourage or confuse discussions about freedom wow I don't know where that originates. I mean, I would immediately be the queen of Google, you know, charter of freedom and trying to do that. Obviously, um, and I say this all the time in my classes, the word freedom 
like the word democracy and liberty and rights, um, those are words that have a lot of meanings and different meanings at different times. And um, in my undergrad classes, I tell my students uh, that they are not allowed to use democracy speak in their papers. And by that, I mean, liberties, freedom, democracy, he writes and with no attempt to explain what they're meaning when they say that, but just sort of throwing it out there. And we're in a moment when that we're seeing a lot of throwing around of rights and freedom um, with very little attempt to define what it means. So I don't know when, when Charter of Freedom come, came about, um, but it's problematic all by itself, just immediately um, for what it is. Um, someone else might be able to Google and, and find it, but um, it, it, those are not, that's not a phrase I would use. A um, couple more questions here, because we got just a few more minutes here. Um, Clinton asks, do you know how lessons from the original constitution affected writing the new state constitutions after the Civil War? Um, I don't actually know um, what, like, like specifically um, when, when constitutions were being rewritten or, or revised in light of the Civil War. I, I don't know specifically how they went back uh, and looked at the original constitution. So that's, a, that's a, actually a really good question, um, but it's one that I do not have the answer to. And now I'm curious about, but I yeah. do not have the answer to it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 read, I read that question. I'm like, okay, well, Michigan joined in 1837. I wonder what lessons, you know what I mean? Like, hmm, our original constitution. Um, Kathleen asks a, a really nice question here. Uh, this is a quotation. Uh, Jefferson and others believed that giving the national government implied power created an unlimited source of federal power, which would quickly overshadow the states, quote unquote, according to Linda Monk in the Bill of Rights. And as you mentioned about Jefferson and strained power, what is your view of implied powers and might or should it be used today, for example, with regards to the virus? Well, we've been using implied powers forever. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense, um, Hamilton won that argument at a really early point and, you know, he didn't, he didn't allow necessarily or create the idea of implied powers, but um, there, that's used all the time. Um, be, because, as I said before, the Constitution is so skeletal and so minimal in what it actually says that their implied powers end up being as kind of as Hamilton argued, seemingly necessary. The question is, um, which is the question underlying this question, how is that used? Um, how implied are the powers? What are the powers being implied? Um, you know, that there's a reason why um, there are many aspects of the Constitution that were left deliberately vague. Mm -hmm. um, and there are all kinds of them that you could, you could pull out from the constitution. Deliberately vague because there was no assumption that you could, at the time, that you could define these things for all time, right? Um, and I think this is a great example of something, you know, not necessarily being given a very specific meaning, but an assumption being that this is gonna have to be implied powers, that the, the actual, um, grounded impact of the constitution had yet to be determined. It created a frame, it framed a government, it created processes. And I've talked about this before, how, how vitally important the framers of the constitution considered the processes of government to be, because no matter what happened, if things went vitally wrong in national politics, the processes of government seemingly would help the country get back on track. But there are a lot of things that are deliberately vague. I would say federalism too, which is the brilliant idea. You know, James Wilson really helped the, at the convention frame this idea that the government, national government can have some powers and states can have some powers and we don't have to define which are which. And that can be a nice little sort of middle area in which power can be distributed. Um, that compromise is what enabled some people who were terrified of national power to sign on to the constitution because they were like, oh, okay, so it's not, it, it's actually, you know, national some, state some, it doesn't feel like it's consolidating all the states into one thing. Mm -hmm. Federalism was a brilliant idea, but at its core, the reason why it was brilliant is because it's, it's vague. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. we, to this day and forever after, will be trying to figure out and different parties will be using in different ways that idea and that ambiguity to try and get what they want by tossing things back and forth 
forth between the national government and the state. So sometimes some of the vagueness in the constitution um, was done from just an absolute reality that there's no way, even at the time, there would have been no way to absolutely define, but um, the, the framers didn't necessarily assume that the constitution would be in effect forever, but they certainly, many of them at least, assumed it would go on for a while. There's an amendment process, so they assumed it would have to be amended, and they kind of, you know, stepped back and, and watched to see what happened. I've, I've talked before about Hamilton um, assuming it would fail uh, and saying that, um, like, within 10 days of signing onto the document, um, he, he thought that, that was actually the first document I talked about on the first History Matters episode was this one. Um, and I, because it's so striking, uh, and he talks about what he thinks will happen next if the Constitution gets ratified. And at the end of that document, he says, essentially, I, I think ultimately it's going to fail. I just do. That's, well, that's remarkable. And, and uh, everything that that suggests is remarkable as well. And it, it, it suggests a lot about the period as well as about him. But it also is a reminder of um, where people were, kind of gets us back to Gienap's book, right? To put yourself mm -hmm. in that moment and think about the fact that people were imagining what a constitution was in a pretty ground level way. <clears throat> um, all right, let's try to get one more in because I love this question. Uh, I'm gonna reuse somebody, which I rarely do. Dave um, oh. says, Jefferson is quoted as saying, these persons whom nature endowed with genius and virtue should be rendered by liberal education worthy to receive and able to guard the sacred deposit, sacred deposit of the rights and liberties of the fellow citizens. What would Jefferson make of today's politicians relative to being endowed with genius and virtue? <laughs> um, well, it's a loaded question, but wow. I. I yeah. I think it's well well stated, so I, I, it might be a fun one to uh, let, let, let me um, answer it in a couple of ways. So number one way is um, there's a reason why he thought about the importance of at least basically educating the populace, the white male populace. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because for people to guard their freedoms and rights, however we define them, they needed to understand what they were and they needed to recognize threats to them. Um, and so for that reason, people needed to be educated, they needed to study history, for example. Um, so education was of political importance um, to Jefferson and the, and the like-minded. So first of all, if you're talking about genius and enlightened, education would be pretty vitally important. Uh, and I'll just lay that out there, you know, like um, being educated about our system, I don't know if you're in government, reading the constitution could be a really good idea uh, and having familiarity with it. I don't know, seems like it might be good. Um, as far as people of, of genius, you know, there was to some degree an assumption that, that merit would sort of rise to the surface and that a Republican small R government would raise people of merit to the point that they could govern and that their um, other people would recognize it and grant those people power. It, it's mm -hmm. nice to say. Uh, obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that, and it didn't always work that way. And not everyone of the framers assumed that that would happen. I was just I was just talking with my um, students about Jeffersonian views of human nature and Hamiltonian views of human nature, and um, we were reading about Hamilton this last Tuesday, Wednesday, and um, we were kind of confronting the fact that he didn't necessarily believe that humankind was particularly good, but he did think you could make government to so that it could channel people's passions into good paths, right? And into, into doing something good. So he was someone who was like, yeah, no, people are gonna be stupid. <laughs> like we, know, we know that. He said it in a far more eloquent way than that. But given that, then it was important to frame governments so that they helped steer those passions. So um, I don't know, the founders might say, these are not people who are um, educated enough, some of them uh, to be in the positions they hold and perhaps might, um, John Quincy Adams actually once told a fellow congressman when he was in Congress that maybe he ought to go back to school and learn a little more than he had before because he didn't seem to understand how the Constitution or Congress worked. <laughs> <laughs> I should find that quote. Um, so the importance of education might be, some of the founders might be thinking about, um, but also, you know, they might, some of them might point to it and say, you know, the system allows different kinds of people to get power and some of them would see that as good and some of them would see that as bad. And that would be a complicated conversation. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let me ask one quick, I know we're running a little bit over, but I want to ask one more quick question, which is uh, from Tom, is ratification by Pauline Mayer one of your favorite books on the Constitution? Oh, wow. Um, well, I, it's hard for me to answer that because it's from Pauline, which means I just love it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great book. Uh, and she, um, we can end with Pauline. Um, I don't know if I've told the story before, but I, I love this story. She gave a lecture at Yale uh, not that long after she'd finished the book. And she talked about how um, she was one of the first, if not the first, people to write a major book on the Constitution using the um, ratification papers, the collection of ratification manuscripts, essays, writings uh, at Wisconsin that went state by state and was, you know, documenting everything that had to do with the ratification debates. She actually made use of that amazing collection, some of which is online in her book. And um, she said two things that, that stuck with me. One was just that she, she couldn't believe how honored she felt to have that at her disposal, to be able to, to put her arms around that kind of knowledge because of that ratification project. The fact that she stood up in front of people and said that, you know, what an incredible gift to be able to mm -hmm. do that. The other thing that she said was that as she was using those um, documents, she stumbled across a document from, I don't even remember what state it was from, someone writing about um, hearing the bells it was a letter about something else, and then the person suddenly heard the bells being rung to signal that his state had just ratified the Constitution. And she said, she, she sat there in a room by herself reading this document, and there was this person having this emotional moment of realizing that his mm -hmm. state had just joined this new union. And she said it brought tears to her eyes because it, it made her feel what was happening in a way that maybe she hadn't before. And I loved that statement because Number one, she's a historian who gave me permission to, to um, reveal my emotion when I teach, uh, mm -hmm. and that's a gift. Um, but also it just shows how immersed she was in the stuff she writes about. She's a brilliant, was a brilliant historian, um, and she never lost her, her sort of human understanding of what was going on. It's part of what made her a great historian. And so all of that, I think, is in that ratification book. That's a fantastic way to end today. So I will turn it over to you to end it out today. Thanks everybody for coming and we will see you at the after party. Okay, so yes, as, my, as I always, I will now explain, uh, we now segue to the after party. Uh, what that means is we no longer record what we're doing, which means we could be a little freer and easier in our conversation. Um, if you are here and you came here um, through the NCHE website, uh, just stay here and we will poof, transform into the after party. If you're watching on Facebook and want to join the after party, you need to leave Facebook and find the NCHE link, which is nche.teach.org slash conversations and just click on it and poof, you will be in the after party. Uh, for those of you not sticking around, Thank you for engaging in democracy every Friday morning. Thank you so much. I always say it and I always mean it for being here on Friday mornings where we can have these kinds of conversations about things that matter at a time when they really, really matter. Um, and I will see you all next week. Uh, and, and this week I decided on Wednesday what the topic was gonna be, although I agreed to it before, because Yom Kippur. And so I had to like, I sent Matt Wednesday night. I was like, let's do this. Yep. And I was like, ooh, it's not Thursday. I'm very excited. Um, at any rate, I will see you guys in a week. Be safe uh, and have a good week. And those of you staying for the after party, I'm sticking around obviously. So join us. <laughs>